I think everybody here has a story about someone who was impacted uh, and afflicted by a drug or disease. It's amazing to hear about um, life-saving discoveries that are made on our platform. We're part of that cause to accelerate drug, drug discovery and research. What was not possible even five years ago, ten years ago, even a year ago, let's say. If, if you can think it and you have the hardware software communicating, anything's possible. We had one customer who was able to fast track a drug and get it to market within a year, so which is nearly impossible. By focusing on software, we feel we provide the best solution in that software space. So we're able to work with the latest technologies in all fields. We've chosen to stay device agnostic because it allows the customer to make the decision on what they feel is best. We are very customer centric. The uh, customer counts a lot. They have a lot of input in the development of our product. Always we are gathering information from the customers. We're not a company that's solely in it for the sake of making money. We are in it for the sake of building a better society. But we're all aligned on the same goals, and that goal is to provide the customer with the best product possible. And do all of that in a field that is really impacting you know, people's well-beings and people's lives. The kind of place we want Biosphere to be for its employees is one for innovation, where they feel they're in an environment where they can think and execute. So we're always looking to expand and to hire, but it's critical that we get the right people on the team. Someone who's really driven and uh, excited about what we do. It's a, it's a team spirit and it's exciting. I like that it's a new challenge every day. The culture at BioCero in working together with the team it is fabulous. The people who do best here are creative problem solvers. The highly motivated people that, that want to make an impact and that can approach these problems in a new and creative way. Who understand that the, 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 the work they do is having a much larger impact than they realize. They do is having a much larger impact than they Why realize. we work and why we do what we do is we want to make a difference in the world. I think it's important that we Why we do what we do. Project Y is, is something that you can see a result from. We can directly affect uh, and improve the lives of people in the community. Every year we collectively vote on one charity. Not long ago we were at the food, local food bank here in San Diego um, and before that we were stuffing teddy bears for kids with cancer. A lot of times you don't end up doing it yourself if you have to do it alone so it's nice to have a group of people that also wants to do the same thing. We donate to cancer organizations, cancer research organizations, or organizations that make a difference in people's lives. And that was important to us. A lot of our customers are driven in that area, and so it's an immediate impact. Hello, and welcome to Automating Your Lab using Green Button Go software. My name is Mike Shossett, and I'm the Director of Corporate Development and Strategy at Biocero. I'll be moderating today's event, which is the first in our summer series. We have a great agenda planned for you today. We'll begin with a presentation from one of our most experienced application staff members. And following that, we will learn about how El Kermes Labs uses Green Button Go in their facilities. After the presentations, we will have several of our technical staff available to answer your questions about automation and Green Button Go. That Q&A session will move off of this webinar platform to a separate Zoom meeting, and we'll supply the link to that at the end of the webinar. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Pat Patrick Cochiarella, the Field Applications Lead for Biocero. Patrick has been with Biocero since 2016. His main focus is to help customers translate their science into automation solutions. He brings deep strategic and tactical expertise to this job. Prior to Biocero, Patrick was a research associate in compound management at Merck, where he oversaw automated compound management workflows for the screening and protein sciences department. He developed automated data streams within limb systems and created novel automation solutions to improve efficiency. Patrick, over to you. Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Cocciarella, Field Applications Lead for Biocero. And first, I'd like to thank you for joining me this morning as we discuss automating your lab processes and workflows with Green Button Go. Today, I'm gonna to start off by giving a brief overview of the benefits of laboratory automation and highlight some of the ways that automation is changing. Then we'll look at some of the features of Green Button Go and how it can enable automating your lab and then see how Green Button Go can be part of a larger ecosystem that provides full end-to-end -end automation within your laboratory. And then finally, we'll move over into Green Button Go where I'll give a brief demo on how simple it is to build a work cell to 
define your process and get running in record time with the most powerful scheduling software on the market. So when we think about the benefits of laboratory automation, the first thing that comes to mind is increased throughput and walkaway time. Automation allows us to miniaturize assays. It allows us to process samples faster or for a longer time. You could run overnight. But in the research field, we also employ some of the best minds. And if they're at a lab bench pipetting samples all day, we're not using them to their full potential. And that walkaway time given to us by automation is more important than any speed can be. But something that we don't think about is the data that we're generating. By fully automating a process, you can collect data any step of the way. That data has higher quality because there's less user failure, less human error. And also by collecting data at every single point, you have more available so you can make better decisions in less time. Laboratory automation is also inherently safe. You're not gonna have ergonomic problems if you're not sitting at a lab bench pipetting all day. And with collaborative robotics, we can work hand in hand with robots while reducing human injury. We can also protect our scientists from potentially dangerous samples in the lab and protect our precious samples from users in enclosed environments. But probably the biggest benefit of laboratory automation is innovation. By allowing us to push further and faster to a cure into a new therapeutic, it forces us to think outside of the box and use these technologies in new and novel ways so we can help develop the cure. If you look back about 10 to 15 years, laboratory automation was really focused mostly in the compound management and high throughput screening space. But that has changed drastically and at a much accelerated rate. We're now seeing fully automated cell culture, spheroid organelle automation. In the genomic space, synthetic biology and next generation sequencing is being automated end to end. In biologics, we can automate vaccine research, antibody production, even more complex processes like protein purification. Even the analytical space in chemistry, LCMS, gas chromatography, purification, all of those things can be fully automated end to end now as new technologies come into the market. Automation work cells are also getting considerably more diverse. Gone are the days of gigantic circular pods around industrial robotic arms. Collaborative robotic arms in a smaller footprint allow us to really configure and customize automation to your lab. Whether it's a large enclosed system or a small reader feeder that's walk up available to any scientist in the lab. From custom engineering solution to handle and weigh and tear sample management tubes, um, to large screening systems. Anything is possible with the diverse hardware selection that's available to us nowadays and engineers that can customize your automation to whatever you need. The way we automate is also changing. Like I said, we're not having gigantic industrial arms moving plates anymore. Mobile robotics can move samples from two automation work cells or from maybe a human user back to an automated setting. We can also use automation to manage manual processes. So we can collect data in an automated fashion from things that just can't be automated, at least not yet. But at the core of all of these different types of automation and the benefits it gives us is going to be an automation scheduling software. And there's five critical components that we look for when we're choosing that software. The first is scalability. Our automation needs to be able to grow and change as our research grows and change. We need to be able to add instrumentation, remove instrumentation at will. We need to have that control. An automation scheduling software also has to be hardware agnostic. We can't let the available hardware limit or restrict what we can do with our automation. We need to be able to use whatever instrumentation is available so we can innovate and improve our research as new technologies are introduced. A scheduling software also needs to be powerful. We need to give our users and researchers in the lab as much control over their process as possible. The research, the science, and our scientists need to dictate the process, not the automation. But it also has to be flexible. No, lab, no two labs are the same. An automation scheduling software needs to adapt and be customizable to whatever the process is. And then finally, 
An automation scheduling software needs to be easy to use. Having a dedicated automation engineer and robotic operator is a great model, but it's not always practical. An automation can be used to its fullest extent if anybody in the lab can walk up and use it. So it was with these five ideas in mind that we at BioCero came up with Green Button Go. Like I said, Green Button Go is scalable. It's very easy to drag and drop devices onto your screen to configure them, and you can change that instrumentation on the fly. That same drag and drop interface is available for defining your process in a fully customized way. You can always add, refine, develop new processes, add new instrumentation, expand your automation at will with Green Button Go. What you see on your screen is just a small slice of the over 200 instrument drivers that Green Button Go currently supports. And we're more than willing to build new drivers as new instrumentation comes out onto the market. So whatever your new reader, your new imager is, you can use it and you can get that data that you want. Green Button Go also has an advanced user mode that gives the user complete control and power over their system. They can script low level instrument commands incorporate C-sharp Python scripting um, to unlock better data management. We can execute external programs. We can even have the system tweet at users when something goes wrong. What we give our users in the advanced mode is really unlimited. And in and of itself, it's almost its own visual programming language to allow you to fully program your automation as you need. From a flexibility point of view, Free Button Go has a series has a number of different tablet or phone applications and also customizable user interfaces. So you can tailor that automation experience to your users. And lastly, Green Button Go is extremely easy to use, hopefully as I'll show you in my demonstration. Um, what you see here is an example of the Ready, Set, Go basic user screen, where when a protocol is deployed to users, all they have to do is walk up, tell the system how many samples they're running and hit go. It really is that easy. Like I'd mentioned earlier though, Green Button Go is part of a larger automation ecosystem that BioCero provides. From order management to designing workflows across multiple automation work cells and manual processes, to data services and data analytics, we can provide a start to finish software ecosystem to manage your data and your automation so you can make better decisions in less time. Looking at how that suite interacts with the automation, anywhere from that manual lab process and pipetting to standalone instrumentation, automation work cells, and huge complex automation systems that use electromagnetic track or mobile robotics. Um, Everything in between that can all be connected and managed through BioCero's larger suite that's centered around Green Button Go. So now, I won't make you wait anymore, we'll head over to Green Button Go and I can show you how easy it is to set up a basic work cell process. So when you first open up Green Button Go, you're presented with your layout screen and the available device drivers you have for the instruments on your system. Starting to build a program is as simple as dragging and dropping an instrument out into your layout. And we can see that we now have access to IP and communication and configuration settings for that instrument. For the sake of our demo, let's envision a small walk-up system um, to read plates overnight. So our samples are left, and before a read, they're going to receive a detection reagent. And this type of system might be used by someone who wants who's processed samples all day and wants to generate their data after they leave for the day. So first we'll start by bringing out a little bit of plate storage. Um, in this case, we're just using you know, four random access hotels, uh, maybe a thermo multi-drop combi as our bulk reagent dispenser um, to add our detection reagent. And then for our reader, maybe we're doing a fluorescence or luminescence read on a EMG Ferrostar. Once we've added the instruments to the system, and configured them, we can go into our unified robotic teach pendant and teach all of our nest positions. Now that our system is configured, we can move into our process tab, 
And this is where we define the protocol that will be executed on the automation. Here on the right, the instruments that we've added to the system are now available to us. So first, starting with plate storage, we're going to bring a plate out of the hotel. From there, it will go down to our multi-drop combi for a dispense, to our Ferristar for our read, before going back in the hotel at the end. Just like in our layout tab, here on the process tab, we're given all the customization that we, can, that we have available um, to set our protocol, set our data outputs. On our multi-drop combi, we can run our protocol. Or maybe in this case, we just want to dispense five microliters to the entire plate. All of those configura configuration options are available to you. Now that we've set that up, we can move into our run screen and we can start the process. The first thing that we see is we're prompted to add plates. This is automatic. In this case, I'll fill one hotel with plates for demonstration. And now we're off to the races and running. As we can see, the instruments that are currently in use are highlighted in green. This here is a mimic of the same layout that we developed in our layout tab. Clicking on instrumentation allows us a very quick and easy view of what plate is currently in the nest, what the status of the instrument is, and so on. In the center of the screen, we see the workflow view. What this is is a glimpse into the lower level advanced processes being executed by Green Button Go. If there is an error, or if you just want to see what's going on in the moment, the workflow view gives you a look into the lower level commands being executed by Green Button Go. And then finally, we have the data view. First up is the instrument utilization. And we can see right now that plates are spending an average of 73% of their time on a multi-drop combi. If throughput is a concern, maybe we want to add a second combi for redundancy. Or maybe that's exactly what we'd expect. The instrument utilization gives you a really nice, high-level, quick and easy way to see where your samples are spending time on the system. We also have available a live Gantt chart view, which so shows you which plates are currently on the system, um, what's already been run on the system, and what's going to be run on the system. You can see here by hovering over the multi-drop combi, we can see when it will be finishing up. And with that, it's taken us about 10 minutes to generate a layout in the software, develop a relatively basic protocol, and run in simulation. So we've already started to collect data in our automation development. Of course, more complicated systems will take more time, but all of the basic steps of dragging and dropping, setting your configuration, teaching your robot, and hitting go are the same. As your automation scales up and gets more complex, Green Button Go will scale up with it. So once you learn the software once, you're not going to need to learn it again. You now have a powerful tool that can help you automate your lab and laboratory processes in record time so you can make better decisions in less time using more data. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Patrick. Great presentation. We're going to open the floor up now to a few questions that you may have uh, of Patrick. Uh, I'm looking in the question bar right now. Just feel free to type them in um, if you have a question. And I'll start with a question um, right off the bat, which Patrick, what, what would you consider to be the main points you want to consider in thinking about fully automating your lab? And second, um, how do you get started with that process? Um, so to address that first part of your question, um, Really, when you're automating your lab, you want to look at your process and your end goal. Um, are you automating a biochemical assay? Are you automating cell culture? Are you trying to incorporate liquid handlers into a larger automated ecosystem? Um, that combined with the talent that you have in your lab and whether or not you might need to hire an automation engineer and also space availability. You know, Can you build a large integrated platform or are you going to integrate a mobile robot to access instruments that are also offline available to your user. Um, you know, it's really what you want to do. So in the case of a compound management workflow, some liquid handlers, maybe some acoustic dispensers, you, know, you think about what that workflow looks like and you know what redundancy you might need, what hardware can support it. And from there, you know, Green Button Go makes it really easy to put all those pieces together and build that workflow out. But if you don't know what you want to automate and you just like the idea of automation, it's going to be really hard to get going. Great. 
Thank you. Do we have any, any other questions? I'll wait just a few seconds here and otherwise we'll get ready and move on. Okay, you know, I'm going to, uh, oh, we have a question that just popped in. Um, the question is, oh, and I just had a uh, connection thing. Let me get that. Okay, so the question is, how does barcoding get incorporated into the process, especially with a hotel that you're filling? Uh, so there's uh, many different ways within Green Button Go that we can incorporate barcodes and sample tracking. Um, the easiest would be, would be to have an integrated barcode reader, either mounted on the robotic arm or on the deck as a nest position. So as samples are pulled out of storage, um, it can read the barcode and log it. Um, if you're working with maybe a work list or particular samples that are coming from a database, um, we can establish direct limbs connections that can populate that storage for you, and you can pull certain barcodes and certain samples on the fly. Um, that's just two examples. There's many ways to add sample tracking, um, which we can discuss at the Q&A later on. Great. Okay. One last question, then we're going to move on. And that is, can you communicate using the CELA standard? So um, when it comes to instrument communication within Green Button Go, um, we utilize the available um, APIs that are provided by the instrument manufacturer. Like I said, BioCero and Green Button Go are hardware agnostic. Uh, so we'll work with any instrumentation. Uh, a lot of lab instrumentation does communicate that CELA standard, and we are fully able to and willing to work with that standard. Fantastic. OK, uh, I see a couple more questions coming in, but we're going to move on uh, to the next talk. And uh, we will address all these questions. Either someone will answer in the chat window for you, or we will bring them up in the Q&A session. So Patrick, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on now, uh, sorry, to uh, Jeff's talk. Uh, Jeff um, from El Kermes is head of compound management, and he's responsible for developing and deploying technologies throughout the research organization. Jeff has over a decade of experience applying robotics to science, and he has a passion for solving hard scientific problems with technology and creativity. He's our kind of guy. In fact, prior to this position he has now, Jeff was a part of the BioCero team, and he led custom robotic projects. He's also a new father. So congratulations, Jeff, and take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, today we're going to take right, a look you. at how we put together a fully integrated lab operation using Green Button Go, as well as a newer offering from BioCero called Lab Experience. Uh, first, just a quick look at what Alchemies is. We are a global biopharmaceutical company uh, focused in the areas of neuroscience and oncology. About 2,300 people worldwide. Uh, we trade on the NASDAQ under the ALK symbol. A uh, number of sites around the world, including Waltham, Mass, which is where I'm based, Dublin, Athlone, Athlone Ireland, as well as Wilmington, Ohio. So before we get into the technology, I'm going to tell you a little story about airplanes. Uh, 1966, Bobby Allen was the director of safe, the Bureau of Safety for the U.S. Civil Aeronautics Board. And in a speech, he characterized airline safety data as a sleeping giant. See, at the time, talking about anything to do with airline safety or potential problems was seen as bad for business. We wouldn't want people thinking these giant metal tubes flying at tens of thousands of feet in the air and hundreds of miles an hour were unsafe. And perhaps he had a point. Uh, despite this... Uh, ten years later, in 1976, uh, the Aviation Safety Reporting System was created. This was a system that allowed anybody to anonymously report observations, potential problems, incidents. Uh, their data were uh, compiled, reviewed, and decisions were made to change how we fly. As a result of this, depending upon the statistic in the year, uh, your odds of dying in a plane crash are somewhere between 1 in 10 and 1 in 20 million. Your odds of even being in a plane crash are about one in a million, so pretty safe. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a fine story, Jeff, uh, but what does that have to do with us? We're already scientists. We do research. We're a data-driven industry, and that's true. But I would argue that we as human beings are actually terrible at handling data, and the data we use is actually quite limited. Uh, all of our experiments, we 
make our decisions based upon experimental data, the primary data. Uh, what comes off of our instruments? Uh, what's the result of our experiments? And behind each of those data points, there are actually literally hundreds, if not thousands of data points that really tell the story. Uh, what was the average temperature, the temperature range of our samples during a particular experiment? Um, what were the mixing parameters? What was the order of addition? The list goes on and on and on. Uh, if anybody uh, has maybe heard anecdotal uh, stories or perhaps even seen some of the publications that are out there uh, that show uh, different people doing the same experiment getting different results. So um, by, by looking at uh, much more context, much more of the story with, with the data, what happened in our experiments, what happened to our samples, uh, perhaps we can tell a different story, uh, make better decisions, and ultimately get to uh, our answers faster. And so really the overlying theme of, of what I'm going to present here of the technology is really based in, in this concept of how do we connect everything so that we have good clean data uh, so that we can move forward and, and actually use that data in this new age of, of data intelligence, um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, whatever keyword or, or particular technology is appropriate for, for um, your situation. So to the technology. Um, First thing I'll do is introduce the concept of a work cell. Now, many of you may already have some of these or are familiar with this, um, but I'll give you my definition. So to me, a work cell is a simple purpose-built robotic system. Now, the, the other side of, of uh, this paradigm is uh, building a giant system that does everything. Uh, if anybody has one of those in their labs, perhaps you're familiar with the sound of alarm bells. The more complex the more instruments we put on a system, the more chances are something will go wrong and um, you're dealing with errors rather than actually running the system. And so with the work cell concept, we really decouple that and we build the systems in a modular way so that we have functionality that's specific for a particular purpose. It, it may not be one specific uh, uh, protocol, um, but maybe a class or an area of, of functionality processes. Uh, and then we can link those individual systems um, with tracks or even mobile robots now, which will allow us to not even have to be co-located in the same room. We can put them in different rooms and have a mobile robot that moves them around. So decoupling them physically, but still being able to integrate them allows us to get the robustness while still having um, a system that has all the functionalities we need. So some requirements to me. Well, first it has to be simple, as I've already said. Uh, and you'll see this is a common theme. Um, really, it's, it's just a robot plus functionality. You have a robotic arm that moves your samples around, and then you put other instruments on that have the functionality you need for your process. So it has to be easy to operate. This is really where Green Button Go delivers for us, I think. Um, it allows us to build custom user screens uh, where you can have the user input, you can have images, you can have diagrams, instructions for the user. So actually starting a run becomes pretty simple. You don't have to be a robotics engineer to run it. Um, and this is really important because if the system is difficult to use, most people that are using it are scientists. They don't want to mess around with it. They're just trying to get their work done. And if it's difficult, uh, sometimes it's even intimidating when, when systems are, are difficult with, with a lot of technology and, and complexity. Uh, they're just not going to use it. And so um, the, the whole point of building the system will sort of be lost because it's not actually getting the use that it was intended for. Um, the other side of this from ease of use is also flexibility for advanced users, for robotics engineers, other people who really know how to make these things work. Um, and, and even for these easy to use uh, protocols, there might be actually a lot of complexity that's required to get that done, get that work done. And so having that functionality in the software as well to be able to do whatever it is that we need to be able to do um, in our workflows is also really important. Green Button Go has that as well. We have um, uh, uh, various languages that are supported for scripts. Um, I've even plugged in custom DLLs or DLLs that you can you can download uh, for your particular um, programming language. So the, the flexibility and, and the ability to do really complex things also exists still with that ease of use of, of using custom screens for the, for the end user. These things have to be adaptable. Um, so 
things change. Science is, is very dynamic. And so maybe we need to scale up. And so scale is pretty easy. We can just add another system, um, plug that in into our workflows. Or maybe the system that we've built is no longer quite valid for, for the kind of work we need to do. And so we can reconfigure these things and, and rewrite the protocols and uh, make it so that it is usable. So we, we get the most out of our investments um, in, in a way that's um, really, really easy to, to do, um, relatively speaking. So finally, robustness. Uh, it has to work. Um, all these other things are fine and great, but if the thing doesn't work reliably, um, you're in trouble. And to me, there's two aspects to this. First, it has to be simple, as I've said before. The more simple it is, the less likelihood that something's going to go wrong. However, um, things go wrong no matter what. It's technology. It's not going to just work all the time without ever having an error. Um, and so being able to recover from those errors is actually equally important. Uh, there's some software out there with various automation uh, that... Um, Error recovery is very difficult, and you might even be stuck having to, to stop the run and you, in the middle of an experiment, you basically lose your experiment. Um, green button go, you can pretty well do anything you want in the middle of an error state. I've uh, swapped out instruments, um, I've rewritten the protocol, rewritten or plugged in new scripts, I've retaught the robot, I mean, it's really a lot of functionality right in the middle of the run. You fix whatever you need to fix and then just keep going, um, so that makes it really nice to, to recover from a run. Also, it's really nice to develop a protocol if you can do those kinds of things because you don't have to restart from scratch every time. So the first system that we built was actually an assay ready plate system. It leverages acoustic dispensing. Um, this is a really high level overview due to time today, so can't really dig into acoustic dispensing, but um, it's a nice technology it uses nanoliter volumes to dispense in our case with compound management, the exact amount of compound we need in every single well. And so we call them acid ready plates because you just dispense the exact amount of compound into the well, and then the biology groups literally just add their biology and run. Um, so it's really nice and efficient. Uh, and we found the, the data actually is, is often a lot better as well from that. Um, so this system uses Green Button Go to drive all of the robotics. We also use software called Transfer Track, which allows us to design the, the uh, mapping of the dispensers with the acoustic dispenser, as well as uh, creating work lists for the work cell whenever we need to do that. So this system has a number of devices, robotic arm to move the samples around. Um, we have a, an ATS acoustic dispenser, um, an eGecko plate labeler, as well as a WASP heat sealer from KBio, the XPeel from Brooks for uh, removing seals, and then from high res, we have a, a micro spin centrifuge, and then an ambi store and a nano serve for uh, plate storage. And so we've used this system for screening. We've used this system for uh, doing dose response curves um, and, and um, all sorts of functionality like that. And it's really been um, a nice system. It's um, I know the screening groups really like getting assay ready plates rather than having to uh, dispense um, and do dilutions and all sorts of stuff through, through the process. Uh, so this, the system has served us really well so far. I'm very happy with it. Now let's take a look at um, the overview of the architecture of, of our lab. Um, and what's nice about this um, is once you have sort of a core architecture, you can plug in more labs. And so this compound management, we could easily roll this out to other labs as well. Um, and, and really start to get some of the benefits that we get um, currently uh, from, from the, the software that we have. So first we have a compound request system. Um, this is a system that um, I developed. It's an internal um, Alchemy's piece of software that uh, allows users to request compounds in the formats that they need and, and what they need um, in order to run the experiments that need to be run. Uh, and then also we have uh, Brooks Freezer Pro Inventory, which manages our compound inventory. And so these two are linked through a REST API, um, and these have to be linked because if you're going to order compounds, it's kind of nice to know what you actually have in stock. Uh, and so these two communicate directly. Now, once you've requested your compounds, well, then it's handed off to a lab that actually has to do the work in the lab, in our case, compound management. So executing the work is really where this line of products from Biosera called Lab Experience uh, comes in. At the center of it is a piece of software called Data Services. 
uh, data services is really the hub. It's what everything integrates to. It's um, really where all of the data flows in and out of. And so uh, data service is really the heart and the center of, of the rest of the software running um, in lab experience. The next bit is order manager. This can be a little uh, confusing sometimes because we have compound request and then we have some other order thing. And um, what order manager handles actually are the individual tasks of a process. So our compound request will say, give me these compounds in this format that triggers some process that has a number of different steps, tasks that need to be done. And so order manager actually manages those individual tasks and creates those tasks um, in each of the individual stations that have um, that functionality in our lab. Um, and so the functionality in the lab, uh, in our case, are these devices at the moment. Uh, so pick from storage, we have to get things from out of inventory. So we have an, a lab experience app that goes with the freezer, ties into Freezer Pro, tells us uh, where everything is located that we need for that particular sample. Um, for lower volume or lower numbers of samples uh, in an order, this is really nice because it actually gives us a, a, an actual graphic view of, of where to get things out of. And I'll show you that here in a few minutes. We have some solids weighing, um, which notice in this case, it's actually directly linked to the balance. So this is really where lab experience starts to become really nice and useful. Uh, for this paradigm of data uh, because we're no longer typing, we're no longer having intermediary steps of, of humans handling data. It's direct from the instrument and to the instrument through the software, through the lab experience app. Same thing with Solvation. Um, we're actually working on getting electronic pipettes integrated into those. Uh, and then of course, Green Button Go, we can um, plug into these pretty, pretty easily and seamlessly as well. Um, so how does this work? Um, well, as I said before, we're really trying to get good data so that we can tell the story of our experiments. Now with an automated system like the work cell I showed you earlier, it's pretty easy. Um, we can just grab the data from whatever the instrument uh, that ran and what it did, and, and we can track all that and put it into a database. Um, that's fairly straightforward. It's all integrated. It's already all connected. However, when you take something like solids weighing or uh, manual pipetting, something like that, uh, you're really largely off the grid in any of these manual processes in the lab. We're off the grid. And so capturing all of that metadata becomes pretty much impossible. Uh, and so we're really not going to be able to tell that story of how did the experiment actually go? What happened in that experiment? Because it's not connected. So the key is we have to connect the bench. So what does that look like? Well, with lab experience, what that means is we need to first create an order and order manager, create a task that needs to be uh, done. And so the information about that order, uh, about that task, is sent to data services, which then gets stored to a database. However, uh, like in our case, you might have some other piece of software where this um, task is originating from, maybe your ELN, in our case, compound ordering system, compound request. Um, and so from there, actually, the request is generated and the, the data is, is transferred through data services, and then the order pops up into order manager. So there's a couple of different ways that this can happen, depending on your configuration and how you're doing it. Um, once you have the order, it shows up in the lab experience app at the particular station you want to do to run uh, for that uh, task. So with that order, uh, data services sends any of the order data, uh, as well as device parameters if, if a device is connected and, and needs to actually get a protocol or something like that, plate maps or, or something. Um, once you select the order, now you just go perform the task, follow the app, do what the app needs you to do. Um, the data uh, as you're processing the request, as, as you're processing the, uh, the task, uh, is transferred back to data services. Um, if there's any live data that needs to come back, and there's an example of that in the demo I'll show you in a few minutes, um, you'll, you'll be able to see that. Uh, and the key part here is we have devices. And so the input and the output of the device is directly connected, no human intervention. And then finally, any data that happens through these processes then gets transferred directly back into your databases, into your limbs. Um, and this is really key, right? Totally hands off. And so what we get, seamless data flow, no humans, easy to use because the, the software is built for task. Um, it's con consistent and efficient because again, it's really sort of not thinking about um, where's the data and how do I you know, set my instrument or any of that stuff. All the data is coming in and out directly. So you're really focused on just do the task. Um, and that brings us a lot more consistency from user to user, um, as well as efficiency and training, things like that. Uh, and the end result is we have clean, usable, trackable, and consistent data, which 
again, to be able to do computational work with the data, to be able to get information out of it, you have to have good data in your databases. And when humans get their hands on it, we actually usually screw that up because we're just, we all do it a little bit differently. And um, by having software handling the data in and out, we're actually cleaning that process up and ultimately getting clean databases. So finally, uh, again, here's the architecture. So let's go ahead and pop over and take a look at a quick demo. Um, so first thing is, this is um, again, our um, compound request system that I developed in-house. Um, I'm not gonna get into it too, too much. Uh, let's say we have, uh, let me just quickly create a, um, an order just so you can see how this process works. Uh, so we'll just select some project, say we do tomorrow. It's a, a um, solid order and um, just grab a couple of compounds. Um, of course, we're using just some dummy compound IDs, nothing proprietary for, for the demo. Um, and then we'll go to the next page, um, put in our amount. So we want one milligram per sample in this case, and uh, we want to put them in a formal file. So now that we've created this, I have this order that I just created here, uh, 44. So the user in the lab will then go and process this request. And so if they process the request, first thing that happens is it says we have pick from store as the first step. So this is where the lab experience stuff comes in. Uh, so let's look at order manager. So here's order manager and notice we have this task that's popped up. Pick from store, it's order 188. Um, so now uh, that we have this, uh, we know that if we go to lab experience, so each of these is a different app. Now you can see pick from store, solids, wings, etc. Each of these would live uh, or multiples, if it was appropriate, would live um, at the station wherever the work is being done. So the pick from store would be probably near a freezer. Solids would be at the balance. Solvation would be where, wherever you do some you know, manual liquid handling near the pipettes. Uh, so if we go to pick from store, we can see we have this order 188, which I showed you in, in order manager. And uh, so if we start this, uh, first thing it says, here's the freezer that we're in. Uh, it tells me I'm in hotel uh, 001 and I'm in box 001. Now, typically, this would all be driven through barcodes because we'd be working with physical samples and I would just scan barcodes. But since I'm at home, we don't have that luxury. So I'm just going to copy and paste. Uh, and so it pulls up the box, tells us, OK, these are the two samples they are highlighted. And I'm just going to click and pick on them. Although typically, again, I would just scan them in rather than, than uh, selecting them it's a little more robust to make sure we actually scan the right the right sample. Um, so you can easily use the graphics and see where things are located, scan them in, and then it's it's done. So now we've picked the two samples we needed. Now the order's gone. So we go back to software, um, our uh, request software. If we see, uh, we go ahead and hit process request, or if we reloaded the screen, it would do the same. Now it says we're at Way Solids. So again, I'll pop over to order manager. We see Way Solids is here. Um, and we wouldn't typically have to go to order manager all the time, especially if we kind of knew the process a little bit and just go right to the station, but I'm just doing this for demo effect, just to show you um, uh, how this is all going. So we have way solids here. And if we notice also on the right, we have the data that's associated with that particular order. In this case, it's pretty simple, just a list of barcodes and amounts, but um, to make that as complicated or um, simple as we need to. Um, so then we go to solids way uh, at the balance and we'd say, okay, order 189 shows us the two source barcodes that we've just pulled actually. So the two source barcodes that it needs and then the amount that it's going to be using. So we start that run. Um, again, I would typically scan barcodes, but uh, for the demo, we're just going to copy and paste. And uh, so we'll do that. Um, now notice also if I actually did 196, which is not in this order and I said, uh, went and did that. Notice it pops up and says, no, it's not actually the barcode that's in this list. So it's a nice check to make sure that we are actually doing the right samples. Uh, so it pulls that out uh, and then I'll use a destination um, that's in our system. So I'll use that. And notice now the tear weight, it actually pulled from our inventory system and told us the tear weight of the, of the sample, which is 1250. Um, and I have this, by the way, balance enabled unchecked because again, I'm at home with not a balance, with no balance here, but in a real world scenario, that'd be checked. It'd be connected to the balance. We'd actually be weighing the balance, uh, the, the amounts off of the balance. Uh, but obviously here I have to type. So if I want one, say 1252, which is actually two milligrams, but we only wanted one. 
shows us deviation of minus 100%. So we're actually not correct there, right? So it shows us that, that um, we need to, to correct that. Um, so now 151, net weight of one milligram matches. Uh, so we'll go ahead and record that. And so now those are recorded. And in inventory, the source is decremented. The destination is updated with the amount and the, the uh, material that we used, that we added to it. Um, so then we'll go and we'll do this um, next sample real quick. So I've pulled that in, destination barcode, um, which is a different one, 1490. So if we did 1490.9, say, we get 0.9 milligrams, and then go ahead and record that. Uh, so now we've done both samples we needed to, so the order has disappeared, and then I'll go back to our software, and it shows, uh, if I hit process request now, see, we're at QC step at this point, um, and so we're done with the lab experience, um, and now it's um, on to the, to the next step, to QC the order. This is actually just a, a development version of the software that I have running locally, so we don't even have QC steps here, so there's no point in getting into any of that. But, um, uh, you have maybe some QC steps here, complete the request, and you'd be done. So that's a, a quick view of, of how all this works. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to conclude with a, with a thank you and apologies. It's always difficult to um, capture everybody, and I surely have missed somebody when we list them out with a project like this or so many people. Involved, thanks to everybody involved uh, from Alchemies, from Biocero. Uh, and of course, you for, for attending and, and um, your attention. Uh, so I think at this point we have uh, maybe a couple of minutes for a Q&A. Uh, and so we'll uh, move on to that. Uh, thank you again. Really impressive what you have set up uh, there. Um, really looks good. And I have a few questions coming in on, on my uh, my thread here. I'm going to start with one question for you. We have about seven or eight minutes. So take your time. Uh, you can put the question either in the question section or just into the chat feed. Um, the question I'd like to start with is, with everything you've got that you showed in your demo, how many different people at Alkermes use this on a daily basis? And how hard is it to bring somebody up to speed? Yeah, so um, at the moment, it's just located in our lab. So there's just a couple of people in our lab. We were sort of the pilot to, to kind of prove this concept. Um, it's a new product from Biocero. So I think we're the first, or at least one of the first, to uh, implement all of these. So it's just a couple of people for now. Um, but the idea is really, um, as we prove out the concept, which it, it works really nicely, um, and, and others see the, the benefits of that. Um, certainly there'll be other labs that we could roll out. Um, as far as plugging in new labs, it's really pretty simple. Uh, it's just a matter of what is the process, what is the task that you're trying to do or the tasks, um, getting those apps uh, into the lab and uh, connecting them up to the system. So like I said before, we have the um, we have the, the infrastructure already set up. So with data services, with um, order manager, that's already there. So now it's just a matter of plugging in more systems. In fact, we're building another work cell uh, with the Hamilton to do um, a storage functionality. Um, and so with that, uh, it's just another another device really. So we just get a, the, the plug-in for lab experience, put that on the system, and um, we can get that up and running. Great, okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to pose another question that's come in, um, and one that we're curious about here too at Biocero is, well, you're using some of the latest in features and some custom features that have been developed. Um, what has been the smoothest part of the whole process for you, uh, and what, what challenges remain that you're sort of excited to tackle or that you're still figuring out how to tackle? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, the smoothest process is, is really working with the team. I mean, we were early customer so this wasn't a finished product so it was really developing a product and so working with the team um, to really figure out what exactly we needed and putting all that together um, it's it's awesome there's, there's so many people that um, are really talented uh, and and getting all the input was, was awesome um, uh, having formerly worked with David I was always happy to work with him again so that was that was really fun um, as far as challenges moving forward one of the things that I didn't talk about which we actually didn't um, implement yet was um, 
order, um, sorry, uh, workflow designer. That's a, a basically it's green button go adapted to the lab rather than to a specific work cell. Uh, but it's really the same concept. It's, um, it's instead of having individual devices on a work cell, you're really looking at devices or systems in your lab and looking at it from the lab level and then developing your workflows that way. Um, and so we didn't implement that uh, simply because it's currently a Windows based software. Um, and as you can see, we're really driving everything through our, through our web app. Um, and so because of that, that compatibility of how do you actually manage a workflow if there's an error, or if there's something that you need to get into the workflow, um, that's not quite a seamless integration. Um, and uh, so I've talked to David about that, and I know that there's some work being done to look at, at how to, to bring that more into a, a web-friendly um, type of environment. Um, so that's one of the bigger challenges that we're looking at and how do we solve that. In the meantime, I've just put together the, the workflows in our in our um, ordering system, so that works fine for now. But if we get significantly more complex types of workflows or as that grows to more labs, uh, I wouldn't want to have that in there. I'd really want to have it in, in the purpose-built workflow um, um, environment. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I think since we have the dedicated Q&A session coming up on the Zoom, I think we, we can go ahead and get started um, wrapping up this and moving over there. Uh, Patrick and Jeff, I wanted to thank you uh, for great presentations. Um, it's really nice. I want to thank the marketing team internally at Biocero and Carol, our events coordinator, for putting on such a smooth event. Uh, we're looking forward to having uh, the whole series run over the course of the summer into the fall. And lastly, thanks to all of you that are that are still here. There's quite a large number uh, with us. That and please move over to the Zoom session because we have uh, lots of time to do the the questions. Um, Donald Chow, the applications lead, and Stephen Damon, our software support engineer, will be the two people on that session available to answer questions, including very technical ones. So uh, the meeting link should be in the window now. Um, and uh, I also, if you want to. Um, see the overall results of the polls or have a discussion about the polling, we'll discuss that at the Zoom session as well. So thank you again. Our next webinar is on August 13th. Uh, I believe if you attended this, you'll get reminders. And at that webinar, we'll be talking about the power and flexibility of Green Button Go and delving deeper into the functionality and benefits. So thank you again for attending.